You're watching Bill on Bankruptcy. I'm Lee Pacquia. I'm joined now, as always, by Bloomberg News Bankruptcy Columns, Bill Rochelle. Be sure to go read his daily bankruptcy column. It's available on BloombergLaw.com, and it's also on the Bloomberg Terminal. Bill, welcome. Good day. All right, so I'm tempted to say that Madoff is our case of the week, but in fairness, uh, that's not quite true uh, because you wrote an intriguing piece about oral arguments held uh, in the Supreme Court um, in a Slusa case that may have bearing on whether Madoff customers are going to get paid in full. Um, how can the Supreme Court rule in a non-Madoff case that would help Madoff victims? And uh, while you're answering that, Bill, can you tell us what the hell a Slusa case is to begin <laughs> with? Because i got to admit, I'm lost here. Uh, Slusa is a real mouthful. It's the Securities Litigation Uniform Standards Act. This was an effort by Congress to put a clamp on what Congress at least thinks are abusive class actions. This particular statute adopted in 1998 says that uh, you can't sue in state court on state law claims in connection with the purchase or sale of securities. Mm -hmm. The case that was before the Supreme Court in October uh, was called Chadbourne and Park versus Trois. This was a case that arose from the Allen Stanford uh, uh, Ponzi scheme. In this particular case, people s were told that the money that they invested in an offshore bank would be uh, in turn in reinvested in stocks on major exchanges. The case went to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals which ruled that it could not be dismissed under SLUSA because no securities were ever purchased. And that was a requirement of SLUSA that the uh, claim be in connection with the purchase and sale of securities because, in fact, there really were none. Well, the lawsuit could survive. This is really the polar opposite of what the Second Circuit held in September in a Madoff-related case where J.P. Morgan, uh, Chase Bank, Bank of New York, and others were let off scot-free when they were sued by some feeder fund investors. In that case, the Second Circuit in uh, New York held that even though there were no purchases actually made, nonetheless, the investors were told there would be purchases and that supplied enough of the nexus to SLUSA to dismiss the cases. Hmm. In the Supreme Court, this whole uh, notion that fictitious sales are sufficient had very tough sledding. Justice Scalia, of course, being the usual plain meaning advocate on the Supreme Court, said that there have been no purchases or sales of securities here, and ergo, SLUSA should not apply. Now, I am not sure how the Supreme Court is going to rule, although I would guess, based upon oral argument, that uh, perhaps all of the judges are of, of the view that SLUSA does not apply in these cases where there were only fictional purchases of securities. Nonetheless, uh, I discerned among the justices enough difference of opinion about where to draw the line that even though the decision may be nine to zero to uphold the lower court, it's very possible there will be no majority decision. And so we won't really know uh, what the ultimate rule of law is here. Hmm. In any event, uh, this uh, oral argument in the Trois case in the Supreme Court, I think raises or should raise hope among Madoff customers that some of their lawsuits are going to be reinstated. And if they are, there is then the, uh, a prayer of hope that Madoff customers will ultimately be paid in full. At the present time, the Madoff trustee has recovered, I'd say, about 55% of customers' claims, but there still is a, a whole long way, many billions to go before they can be paid in full. Right, sounds like we're halfway there. Uh, and Bill, I cracked up when I read a story of yours about a uh, decision written by District Judge Victor Marrero at the expense of John Corzine. Uh, Corzine, of course, the former CEO at MF Global, uh, the defunct broker that uh, uh, lost about $1.6 billion in customer money. Um, other than being a pleasure to read, what does Judge Marrero's opinion actually mean? I may be reading too much into the opinion, but it struck me that Judge Marrero, a district judge in New York, is among those who are of the opinion that Wall Street types sometimes get off too easy and lawsuits against them are too prone to be dismissed. As you said, Lee, this involved the... Uh, uh, the uh, MF Global case, where a billion, $600 million of customer money simply couldn't be found initially. 
Marrero basically told everybody, listen here, don't make motions to dismiss because with this much money missing initially, something must have gone wrong somewhere. Uh, they did not, however, listen to him, and John Corzine, the former CEO, along with all of the other 22 other defendants, made a motion to dismiss. And Marrero's decision is a pip. Hmm. It is marvelous reading. Everybody out there who wants to have a, an enjoyable 10 minutes should go read the first, I'd say, 15 pages. You don't want to read the whole thing because it's 105 pages long at its uh, entirety. Uh, Judge Marrero, uh, as I said, began with the assumption up front that something here went terribly awry. And that, by the way, is a quote. He then went on to say that Corzine and the other defendants were working on the theory, and again I quote, that nothing happened at MF Global for which a single one of the 23 defendants could possibly bear any legal responsibility. He went on and fleshed it out a little bit more and uh, said that the defendants were insinuating uh, that the debacle must have been the fateful work of supernatural forces. Hmm. He then went on to say that basically Corzine was raising what he called a stuff happens defense that instantaneously of its own accord without any knowledge or ca causal agency whatsoever, these catastrophes right. seem it's to happen. It's a flexible strategy. You it's can apply a lot of, it certainly is. A lot of cases. And then he really, uh, near the end of his uh, introduction to his opinion, put his finger right on it. He said that uh, it was a fair inference that the defendants were insinuating that the big mess up, the billion dollar, two billion dollar mess up, at uh, MF Global is the governing industry standard for doing business. In other words, Marrero seems to be of the point of view that when things go wrong, somebody has got to be held responsible. And of course, as we know, ever since the financial catastrophe back in 2007, 2008, a uh, few people other than, you know, let's call them middle of the road uh, nudniks mm -hmm. have been held to task. Mm -hmm. And here comes the uh, knuckle curve segment for the day. We actually had some nice sized chapter 11 cases in the last week. Does this mean that there's finally hope for the unemployed bankruptcy professionals out there? Yes, but only if you live and work in Delaware because it doesn't seem to be happening anywhere else. We had Global Aviation, a uh, charter airline flies mostly for the government. They could only survive some nine months out of bankruptcy. They are back in bankruptcy. Interestingly, the first time they reorganized, that was in Brooklyn, New York. Hmm. This time they deserted for Delaware. We also have Physiotherapy Associates, the largest physical therapy provider in the United States. Uh, again, New York even lost out, and this one went to Delaware. I think I may have said this before, Lee, but uh, Delaware is really getting, in the last six months, the vast majority of they're cases, on a hot streak. even over New York. And I got to tell you, uh, if this keeps up, I think they're going to kill the golden goose. Hmm. Because if we get a situation where 95% of all the major bankruptcies are in Delaware, that's the point at which I think Congress is going to do something. It would probably be a good idea if the uh, Delaware judges somehow selectively could send some of the cases back to the home venues and keep some of these slam dunk uh, prepacks and things of that sort. Hmm. Let's close out with a look at the stats section. Um, beyond the occasional new Chapter 11s typically filed in Delaware, what are the statistics telling us about the prospects for an uptick uh, in, the in the bankruptcy business nationwide? Well, again, uh, there is not much new, but maybe something new that I'll get to right at the, uh, uh, at the end. Uh, most importantly, the jump bond default rate is still bouncing along the bottom. Hmm. It is at uh, the rate uh, in the last 12 months of about 2.5%. And Lee, as a default rate, that's barely enough to fog a mirror. It's pretty much unchanged from October. It's down in the U.S. about a tenth of 1%, but that's not enough to write home about. Uh, uh, importantly, Moody's is protect predicting that the junk default rate by this time next year is going to be 2.4%. In other words, fractionally down from where we are uh, right now. This does not pretend any uptick in business. Now, when it comes to uh, bankruptcy filings on the whole, and I'm especially meaning by that individual bankruptcies, I am pretty convinced now that we are at a cyclical low. 
Uh, we're 13 percent uh, on an annual basis uh, below where filings were this time last year. But the important thing is, in the last four or five months, there really hasn't been much change. We mm -hmm. seem to be bouncing along the bottom uh, on uh, uh, individual filings. However, in the, this period in the last couple of months, every once in a while, there's a little indication of an uptick in individual bankruptcy filings. I'm not yet uh, in a position to declare that this is going to happen, but uh, my guess is it probably will. In the macroeconomic world, uh, people uh, were enjoying extremely low uh, interest rates for new home mortgages, for buying cars, and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, rates are up a little bit, but more importantly, uh, home mortgages are not available as easily as they were a while ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm beginning to wonder if maybe this, among other factors, will contribute to an increase in consumer bankruptcies in the next year. It's all about interest rates. Bill, thanks for that. All right. That's Bloomberg News bankruptcy columnist Bill Rochelle. If you'd like to learn more about the cases and issues we just discussed, be sure to go check out Bill's column. It's available on BloombergLaw.com, and it's also on the Bloomberg Terminal. You can see more of our videos on YouTube, and you can follow our updates, of course, on Twitter. I'm Lee Pacquia. Thanks for watching.